So we have a, a special treat this morning. Uh, I, as you heard earlier, Dr. Iatridis was joining us today, and I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Iatridis when my office was up on Annenberg 20, and we fortuitously bumped into each other and had a chance to learn about each other's background. And Dr. Iatridis is really kind of a, a known research entity in the orthopedic research world, and it's really done a lot of uh, things within orthopedic surgery uh, with some cutting edge research. And it's just right right above us on the 20th floor. He has a full lab there, biomechanical uh, research lab that really studies a lot of innovative uh, aspects of, of spine disease. And, you know, I think today we're going to get a glimpse into some of that. But, you know, I think this is going to be a, a great potential opportunity for us to uh, work with Jim including our residents, you know, some of our residents have met with him already. And I think it's, it's, it's going to be a good lasting uh, friendship that I think will grow. So Jim, thank you for joining us today. And we're really looking forward to your talk. Okay. Thanks, Costas. Um, uh, real pleasure to be here. Um, and let me pull this up. Do, are you all seeing the full screen? Hopefully it's coming. Yeah, we up. can see it now. Perfect, great. Well, I, you know, I, it is a real pleasure to be here, and you know, it's really nice to be at a talk in your home institution. Although it was funny, I was out, I, at a talk at McGill yesterday, but from the same spot. Um, so uh, we will get through this, and uh, but it, it, it really does feel different. Um, and it, it was a real pleasure to. Uh, to actually listen in on on the prior sessions, uh, you know, just making a, a couple of comments for uh, first, congratulations on the uh, increasing NIH funding, and uh, I know the uh, neurosurgery department has really been uh, increasing momentum uh, both for for uh, clinical trials as well as uh, uh, both NIH and and beyond, uh, and uh, you know, just as a as an as a data point because. Uh, uh, Dr. Peterson showed the um, the Blue Ridge. Uh, I, I just looked at. I mean, we we also track that for orthopedics, and just the data point for this year, we're at about 2.5 million um, for for the department's uh, research on on Blue Ridge, and and that puts us at uh, number 17 in the orthopedics cohort. So. Um, so we're pretty close partners, um, uh, and uh, I think, uh, as Costas, you said, I, I, the opportunity to collaborate is uh, really uh, helpful in here, and uh, it will make us all better. So I'm, I'm really glad to be uh, participating in this session. And, um, and yeah, really interesting cases, and I love the neuroanatomy primer there. Uh, that, was, that was really excellent. Um, uh, and, and nice to see how, how interactive the whole thing was. So I'll, I'll just speak a little bit. Uh, so today I'm really going to focus on our, our, our annulus repair <clears throat> strategies of, and, and uh, I'll give a little bit of background on orthopedic research lab. Uh, we've got uh, uh, four PIs and, and our, our, and the basic and translational program. And obviously there's clinical research that's, uh, that's very active as well. But uh, in spine, which I really uh, lead, and I, I really, we're very interactive and collaborative with the, with the surgical team too. So, so I'm really a partner with Andy Hecht on that and, and uh, work with the other spine surgeons as well. We try to make sure we stay as grounded in the clinical problem as we can. Um, and then we also have strengths in tendon development and regeneration and matrix biology. Uh, and we just recently hired a new uh, tissue engineer uh, who's really focused on muscle stem cells, but is really a fabulous new uh, addition uh, named Wu Jun Han. So, um, so we're already, he's already enhanced our program as he uh, submits for his first few NIH grants. Uh, and, um, and it, as you described, Costas, we have some cores. Uh, we've got really good spine bio or biomechanics, and uh, we, can, uh, we can do axial torsional bending loads on large spines, but we also have a bunch of systems that could, could uh, uh, test uh, rat and mouse uh, spines and, 
and small pieces of tissue as well. We've got uh, really excellent histology core. Phil is our, is our uh, engineer uh, core manager. Damien is our histology core manager. Um, and uh, we also have lots of uh, cell and organ culture uh, facilities and, and uh, we have do a bunch with animal behavior testing as well. As I said, we try to be fairly integrative. These pictures now uh, are a little bit dated, but um, but it, we Andy has done a bunch of uh, work with us, hacked, and then and then we've worked a bunch uh, most closely with uh, Sam Cho as well. Even though he's uh, been pivoting a bit more into machine learning, where we're somewhat collaborative on on those projects as well. Um, uh, you know, I, one of the things I like that uh, Sinai highlights is, uh, you know, in the PhD program, we, uh, uh, they, there's, they started the PhD lab coat ceremony, uh, committing to high integrity and in, in research. And, and uh, this was obviously pre-pandemic, uh, but, uh, but we, we have, uh, we try to be very collaborative with the group and all our, our, our doors are open. So be nice to, uh, continue that culture. And I think that's a culture that permeates the institution. So <clears throat> I'd like to continue that uh, with uh, in other departments, including including yours when opportunities arise. Uh, so uh, uh, so we, we've been um, uh, really have sort of two main uh, tracks in our spine research um, in the basic and, and translational. And one is, uh, really what I'll refer to as specific uh, pain if we, we have a herniation, for example, and annulus fibrosis repair. And I'll mostly speak about that today. And then what I'm not really gonna speak about, but the neuroanatomy uh, session uh, made me think about it a lot and you know, probably tons of areas for collaboration and interaction is uh, we've been really interested in how a spinal injury might lead to both acute and chronic pain and the transition from a, acute to chronic and how to manage that. And, and there's really very little that's known uh, in the interaction between, for example, a disc injury and both the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. So I, I think this is an area of opportunity. We're submitting grants on this now to the NIH. We've got one in review. I plan to submit uh, or, or, res or resubmit that in uh, this month or in March, um, but we really are interested in things like uh, understanding uh, injury uh, and crosstalk between these tissues, and I think that's a great area. Uh, the bottom is trying to sh show that we really try to ground this in human health and, and disease, and so we've, we access autopsy samples and we'll often do on the lower right um, uh, histology of these large human intervertebral discs. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, right, so, and we have a, a bank of, of autopsy specimens, which we'd like to continue building on. Um, we typically collect uh, surgical samples now um, for uh, on demand as needed if we want to collect cells, for example, or for a specific project. But, but I think there are opportunities for banking and, and in terms of a vision to increase funding, sometimes having these uh, really special resources that you build over time really um, are compelling to uh, NIH uh, reviewers because it's really a unique resource that they like to support an institution for. So I, I think partly you can't have a tool without a question, but I think uh, some brainstorming around the question and building up database with the high clinical volume that we do uh, in neurosurgery and, and in orthopedics would really create some opportunities for uh, wonderful science, uh, uh, wonderful knowledge, and I think be very compelling to NIH reviewers as well. So I'd love to uh, uh, continue those discussions offline. Um, the the um, I'll talk uh, sort of three three main topics. Um, uh, very briefly, I'll go through a painful disc degeneration uh, and then talk about uh, annulus repair strategies and then end on on the concept of regeneration and um, and cells. Um, and so uh, so the, we had these great papers that came out a few years ago in The Lancet highlighting back pain as a leading cause of, of global disability. And um, 
they, they really one of the major conclusions of this paper is that uh, you have to treat the whole spine and a lot of times interventions for DISC are not necessarily so, uh, so well indicated. But I think another message, certainly when I'm thinking about these, um, uh, it, the way we think about science is that is that the disc uh, disc issues are implicated in uh, in a lot of these um, in a lot of these problems, even though it's often not a surgical indication. Um, so um, so in particular, if you have a bulge protrusion or extrusion, uh, highly highly related to pain and disability. Um, and um, and often surgically indicated. I'll get into that a bit more. This is more of our human um, histology samples, and and this uh, so this is vertebrae, disc, vertebrae section, anterior. It's a sagittal section, and in this staining, uh, the annulus fibrosus is red. Uh, these uh, fiber bundles are a little hard to see. You can see them a little bit better here. The alternating fiber bundles. And um, the nucleus propulsus is uh, is staining blue because of the high proteoglycan content, and you know why. And and we can see it in higher magnification here. So this we would consider quite healthy. Um, but what's always so interesting in looking at human discs versus uh, versus uh, uh, versus animal models is just the accumulation of different changes that happen over decades and. And um, certainly, we get a more fibrous uh, nucleus propulsus. And um, now, this so when we get uh, disc degeneration, uh, we see the loss of that red staining, um, and we see defects. So we're seeing an end plate defect here. Uh, we're seeing fissuring. That fissuring and loss of proteoglycan led to a depressurization, depressurization of the annulus. So we see inward buckling of those fibers here, and um, and this uh, it really is almost the same age, this sample, um, as, as the last one we've seen. So um, that sort of takes me to my next comment. This is actually the same sample with a slightly different uh, staining uh, parameter, but uh, or staining uh, method. But, uh, but really, the difference between aging and, uh, and disc degeneration is these uh, accumulation of structural defects. And, and it's particularly an issue when it's um, when it's a, a, a pain pr producer, which it typically is no, we think of with, with um, annular um, defects, which I'll focus on today, but we know a lot uh, of pain generation and end plate defects uh, through neo-innervation as well. And, um, and really in, in severe degeneration, we'll get a complete collapse of, of that, uh, dis of that disc height. Um, so again, sort of we, we think of this as, uh, uh, and I think what you all know much better than, than I do is that disc defects on MRI often don't predict pain. So you need the physical exam, you need a lot, um, a lot more uh, specific information. And, and really, I, I enjoyed those case studies quite a bit. <clears throat> um, and um, or, or learning and listening to that. Um, so again, we're going to really focus on this disc herniation type type uh, question. Uh, and, and, and the reason they're both important is, I mean, I think disc, discogenic pain, often hard to pin down to a specific disc pathology. It's still, disc issues are still estimated to be about 40% of the contributors to, to those pains. So, so again, we definitely think of the whole spine and the surrounding tissues, but we've been so disc focused that it's nice to collaborate with others who have expertise in, in the sur surrounding tissues. Uh, so with that in mind, I'll, I'll, I'll shift to our annulus repair strategies. And there are, um, so again, we might have a herniation pushing on the, the nerve root and compressing uh, the nerve, causing either pain or disability. And really, there's been a bunch of different strategies uh, tried through the years, uh, right? And di with discectomy being the main clinical uh, solution here to address the neuropathy issue. Um, uh, and you, obviously, you want to intervene before chronic nerve damage, um, and, um, but, but typically what happens is you don't repair that annulus defect. So, um, so people have been trying for quite some time to, um, 
to, to um, repair annulus defects. Uh, suturing is common. Uh, even suturing with a uh, with a uh, anchor, uh, neither of these were bore out clinically. There's been some bad ideas like this uh, this uh, uh, hard plastic uh, annular closure implant that just caused a lot of disruption. Um, what does have FDA approval now um, is this uh, barricade closure device where where you have this a material where this lower metal anchor anchors into the uh, into the end plate there, and then you have this flap that prevents reherniation, and has been shown at least in, in early trials to maintain disc height. Um, so it has some promise. There's some subsidence that happens with this uh, anchor, and then this uh, this material flap will cause some damage to the end plate, the the superior end plate. Uh, so uh, and it really doesn't have a mechanism for healing. It really just is a is a strategy to prevent reherniation. So uh, so that's um, that. So we've been really thinking a lot more uh, about what can we do that mimics the the native tissue better and that might promote healing. So um, so and I'm really going to zoom through this, but you see some of these very structured materials uh, on the SEM and other and other strategies that are really trying to uh, mimic the annulus fibrosis. Uh, and we've really pivoted away from that because we, our thought is we really want to seal this uh, defect uh, using an adhesive. So, so the conceptual model is here where um, a, a need for an injectable, you might have this, uh, this disc herniation, the discectomy procedure to remove that herniated tissue. And the thought is, if you take out this tissue, this disc is gonna degenerate, uh, it's still well indicated, so it's still a good thing to do, but you might have some long-term uh, pain uh, there. So can we inject something, seal this defect, prevent that disc degeneration, and while we're at it, maybe also uh, inhibit some of the reherniation potential in, in, after that discectomy procedure. So, uh, so we want to seal that annular defect, ideally restore the disc height and mechanical function of that of the uh, spinal motion segment and promote repair. Um, we, uh, it's discectomy is already a successful procedure, so it needs to be injectable and rapidly gel to translate into currently uh, largely successful procedures. Uh, the disc must withstand large spinal loads. So it, it, that's one of the challenges. And often uh, it degenerated or injured discs will have a chronic inflammatory condition that inhibits repair and regeneration. So, um, so that is the challenge there. And it's, uh, this is advancing a little slowly. So let's see how we're doing. Uh, so we we've been using fibrin, which is a, a you know is a, a commonly used sealant uh, blood product. It's been shown to have some success in mini pigs, although the clinical trials didn't improve um, uh, over uh, over saline. And so what we've done is uh, add a crosslinker, Genefin, which is from the gardenia plant, and this is a natural crosslinker fairly commonly used in tissue engineering. And this does two things. It increases the stiffness of the, of the fibrin to make it a little closer to annulus behavior. And it also slows the degradation rate. This is a, a cow tail. We like cow tails as a model system because they're large and you could apply high forces. Um, they're not a perfect mimic of humans, but they're easily available. We can get them from the slaughterhouse. Um, and uh, the very efficient uh, and useful model commonly accepted in the spine. So this is a vertebrae disc, vertebrae section uh, with the end plates cut uh, shortly. We create a defect. And then this uh, fibrin genepin after, it's a genepin after a cross links, it, uh, it turns blue. So I'll give you, so we've done a bunch of optimizations on this through the years. We've done in vitro optimizations, we've done in situ, meaning um, vertebrae disc, vertebrae sections. This is more like tissue tests or material tests. And then we've uh, really been increasing this to preclinical. And I'll really focus on just a couple of pointed ones, but, but we have really all these assays available for testing materials and tissues uh, in the lab. Um, 
So, um, so we'll talk, and then it, this has spanned several years, and we, we've worked with a bunch of different PhD students and postdocs at, at um, Mount Sinai. So I'll focus on a few things like material uh, um, testing and uh, in situ biomechanical testing. So this is the test of, uh, if you're looking at a little piece of material, either in compression or torsion, we ca calculate the compressive modulus or the shear modulus. There's lots of numbers here. I don't expect you to see, uh, read all of them, but the first number F is the concentration of fibrin in mg per mil. The second number here is the concentration of genepin in mg per mil. And what we're, and the gray bar here is the physiological range of the native tissue. So what we're showing here is, is we can titrate these concentrations to uh, mimic the compressive modulus and the shear modulus of, of the native tissue. Um, if we're using, in particular, we can get there, we use a high concentration of fibrin and a high concentration of genepin. Um, now I'll ask it, since this is interactive, I'll, although uh, I'll ask, uh, I might ask it more rhetorically, but let's see if anyone has an answer. We, we're not good at matching the um, the tensile properties of the annulus. So, so any thoughts as to why? Anyone want to throw out a guess or? Uh, okay. Um, I mean, just based off of the the graph here, um, you're seeing a a change more significantly as you're adjusting um, your uh, your fibrin. From 140 to 70 to 35, but it, when you're including your your genepin, you're not really observing much of a difference in your dosages. I mean, from from your shear modulus across you know, six to one, uh, I guess it, uh, micro or milligrams. I don't know. Yeah. But, um, yep. You're not really you're not really seeing a change based off of including that at all. That that's a great observation, um, and um, so you know it, it, we do pretty well on this shear modulus. That's what drew, drove us early on to um, to add more genepin. Uh, but you're absolutely right. We are we are noticing that. That's a great observation. Um, so and and genepin, I'll get to a little bit later. Does have some some um, issues as a crosslinker that aren't ideal. So so we are titrating this down, especially as we're thinking about. Uh, other, other um, uh, delivering cells and other indications uh, and, and drugs. Um, so it's a, it's a great observation. Uh, but I, the point, the other point I was going to get at is these are very small fibers um, in fibrin, and it's it, we really can't mimic the native, um, the native annulus fibrosis um, with an injectable. We haven't figured out how to how to engineer that yet. It, it, inject something with really large fibers that's highly integrative. So as a result, we can come pretty close with compression and, and shear, but we really can't match tension. So that's sort of where we're at now. Um, we then, the next test is uh, looking at this in situ where we have a vertebrae disc, vertebrae section, and we apply a force till we force a herniation. And an intact disc, that, that failure occurs from end plate cracking um, at very high levels. And in, when we have an injury, we get that herniation at lower levels through annulus herniation of the material. The, again, the gray bar here is physiological stresses. Um, so, um, and so what we see is if we've got the failure strength of the healthy is really high. Um, if, if we have an injury, we, um, we greatly lose that failure strength uh, if we use a very high concentration of, of uh, fibrin and genepin, we can restore this above physiological range. And, and this is pretty good, uh, even though you know, we'd like it to be a little bit, uh, have a slightly higher safety margin, but, but it's really better than any other materials we've tried. And, and then the de deflection to failure is also uh, significantly improved for this condition as well. So we do think it has a lower herniation risk than, than doing nothing. Um, you'd have to have a very aggressive uh, discectomy to, to come close to this. Uh, this is sort of one of the first tests we did, just uh, saying a proof of concept, how's it gonna work? This is a vertebrae, disc vertebrae from the cow tail. It's got strange bone anatomy, as you can tell. We've got our defect. 
you, you inject and initially the gel is yellow with uh, after gelation, gelatin turns blue. Um, so uh, this is uh, one of the biomechanical test systems. We can apply torsion or, or bending. We're not showing our bending fixture here, but, but uh, one of the classic spine biomechanical tests of the vertebrae, this vertebrae section is an increase in motion under, under three degrees of flexion. So you can get bending, flexion extension, or, or torsion. And we're seeing an increase in motion following that annular defect, which in many conditions, in particular the axial is, um, uh, is uh, the, ax the bending and flexion extension is restored uh, for the repair. Now, again, in torsion, where you're really, as you twist, you're really stretching those annular fibers. We only got a partial repair. And that's really, again, really not surprising because the material we're, we're using. And it's a real, it's a challenge. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's about as good as we could do. Um, again, we, we can keep these vertebrae, just vertebrae sections alive in, in an organ culture model system. This uh, system can load uh, different, actually human or cow tail intervertebral discs. And uh, we can see how they do under many cycles of loads over, over a longer duration. And, um, and uh, the most sensitive, but least specific uh, issue or parameter to measure is disc height loss. With the injury, you lose a lot of disc height. And we were able to retain that after, after our 14,000 cycles. We we're quite pleased about that. And the media uh, showing self-stress of nitric oxide was increased and that was also restored. So, so again, things looking good. Um, this took us to Switzerland to what's the AO Research Institute where um, you know, we can actually do, at Sinai, we actually have large animal facilities. We can do sheep and pig. A lot of the cardiology folks do sheep. Uh, sorry, I should say pig and some folks do sheep as well. Um, but, um, but really the facilities are excellent at, uh, in Switzerland and the sheep have better quality of life and you don't have to have uh, endpoint measurements, um, uh, only endpoint measurements uh, because of the way it works. So, and there's also funding led us to uh, work be in Davos as well. So uh, we did a one month um, uh, pilot study looking at fibrin genepin and also looking at a scaffold and I'll describe that first and then we, we moved on to a 12 month study and uh, we got sort of mixed results and I'll also share that. We ended up using the uh, an anterior approach of a cheap cervical spine, cervical because the disc height's a little higher, um, anterior to not have to deal with the nerve structure. So we uh, just uh, as, a, as a proof of concept, and we used a biopsy injury and, uh, um, and that was our strategy. Um, this is our fibrin genepin early on, and this is our control intact, vertebrae, disc vertebrae, um, and this is our anterior uh, uh, region of the annulus fibers. And this is uh, after a month, we had a uh, fibrin uh, sealed this defect. We had a membrane here, and you can see the blue sutures here on histology. That actually uh, we found wasn't necessary to seal these defects. Uh, so, and then we had some, uh, some end plate injuries that we saw as well. We tried these scaffolds and, and the scaffolds kept herniating uh, regardless of whether or not, and, and the membrane and the, and the suturing didn't help. So, so we, we sort of didn't continue on the scaffold here, but we, um, and the scaffold was intended to mimic annulus properties a little bit more favorably. And uh, the channels here uh, mimic the annular fiber orientation with the thought that uh, annular, uh, annular cells might be able to grow collagen in an oriented way. Um, but a better concept than practice on that. Uh, so this is our intact and the 12 month study. This is our fibrin uh, with genepin repair. We're very happy about this healthy repair, fibrous repair, looks great. If we could have stopped here, we would have been thrilled. But the challenge was um, th this is the injured and the injured also heal. And there's a, and so we showed equivalency um, and we didn't really show any adverse effects, but, but one of the challenges for this was 
we cause some end plate defects with this biopsy injury. The, the sheep annulus is really tough. Um, and, um, and we didn't go deep enough, so we didn't cause a true herniation. So, so we're sort of modifying this model. And we, unfortunately, we have to do another round, which is in process. So, um, so we're refining the sheep disc injury model with a scalpel to promote more degeneration um, without end plate defect. And we're, we're, we're also now refining our fibrin genitin for, for cell delivery. Um, and, um, and there's a bunch of clinical trials that have been showing pretty good results on, on uh, disc cell, uh, uh, on cell injection for disc degeneration. And, um, and it's really, this now it's a little dated, Daisakai, Gunnar Anderson, Nature of Abuse and Rheumatology that summarizes a bunch of them, but it really shows that uh, most of these have, have positive outcome. A lot of them are small and not well controlled. The first really good, I think, or one of the best um, cell delivery trials, uh, it was well designed. It's only out in press release now, so we'll see how it goes. But, but Mesoblast just had their phase three trial results. They had their press release a couple of weeks ago, and it both reduced chronic low back pain and reduced opioid usage. So, so that's a good, um, good news. Uh, but it, we're also now um, seeing uh, but, um, but it didn't necessarily improve uh, disc degeneration. Um, but, but this is promising for cell delivery. So there's really two big challenges. What's the cell source you're gonna use and uh, what's the cell delivery method? So I'll speak on sort of both of these a little bit. And, um, and we during COVID ramp down, one of the PhD students, Chris Panabianco, did a systematic review on disc cell delivery systems. Uh, there's really, uh, there's a bunch of papers and increasing, but really overall, not that many. And, um, and the vast majority of them are in yellow are for nucleus pulposus repair and cell delivery. A uh, very few on this annulus cell delivery challenge. Uh, really the biomaterials have a great, because the biomaterials have a greater need to stabilize the, the disc motion segment as, as I've been talking about. So we sort of have the idea of a biological competence that uh, in typically materials that, that are really good, favorable for cells rapidly degrade and might promote a biomaterial herniation. Whereas uh, we've been really focused on biomechanical competence, uh, but the, the consequences was already highlighted. Can we reduce that genopin cross-linking because all cross-linkers have some cytotoxicity and, um, and make sure we get, um, uh, cell, make sure the cells are happy in there. So this is something that we've been uh, sort of focusing on. Can we balance this uh, in, a, in a biomaterial strategy? And this is an SEM of where a cell was in its fibrin genitin. We titrated it for a few different conditions. And you know what we're seeing is uh, some, where the pink arrow is, is some matrix that was laid down by the cell, but it's really just adjacent to the, to the, to the cell. And then we're not surprised uh, by this, that it's so local because the, uh, the, the blue arrows are showing a really, really dense matrix. So uh, that's what we need for mechanical strength in this type of a material strategy that's injectable and adhesive, but, but the cells aren't happy there. So, um, so, so this is, um, so what then happens to these cells that are, that are injected? They undergo apoptosis. This is cleave caspase three, um, and it's brown if it's apoptotic. Uh, these brown arrows showing positive cell, and then tunnel as a second validation uh, in green. And we're just seeing a lot of these cells are apoptotic, really high levels of apoptosis. Really, regardless of it's really from the presence of genitin. So, um, so as was raised before, how much genitin do you really need? Even if we bring it down. We still need it, but we do seem to need it for longevity, um, and and it does offer some benefits for for uh, stiffness as well. Um, so we wanted to look into this a little further and see uh, what wh why these cells are undergoing apoptosis. There's two concepts here. One is is it cytotoxicity of the crosslinker, and the other is is it because the cells aren't able to adhere to this very dense matrix. So this is fibrin, no genitin here. If we add an inhibitor of cell attachment, um, cell adhesions, we increase that apoptosis a certain amount. 
if we add genifin to this fibrin, we increase this quite a bit more. So the reason, so our, our inference here then is that genifin is then causing, both probably preventing cell attachment and causing an additional amount of cytotoxicity. Uh, interestingly, if we uh, add fibronectins, this gives to our fibrin genifin, this gives uh, additional cell adhesion sites. We can restore a bunch of that apoptosis. Um, and um, so that, so we can restore some of this, but now we have sort of these two things that are happening, cytotoxicity and cell adhesion. So we, we designed this oxidized alginate microbeads and our plan is to now create a, a composite that has this fibrin genifin, but also has these cells delivered in there in these oxidized alginate microbeads. Oxidized alginate is nice because it degrades. So the concept is that the cells can be relatively happy in as we inject them, protect from the initial cross-linking that happens over about uh, two to four hours. Um, and um, and that then, then they will, these microbeads will eventually degrade and the cells can spread out and produce matrix. That's, that's the conceptual model. And this is really new results that are ongoing. So, so we're still working on this. This is, can we make these microbeads? We uh, did hand pipetting and we had, um, we had a machine uh, create these microbeads. The machine had smaller beads that were a little bit more consistent in size. Um, so we're gonna use that method. This is histology of fibrin genifin, a little blue, and the um, alginate microbeads in, in more white with some, some cell staining in, in, in there. This is high magnification, that's about a millimeter. So, uh, so we make these composites. Um, we look again at our, at our apoptosis. How did we succeed? So we've got uh, fibrin. Uh, this is the baseline. This is largely related to the, uh, to the assay. Um, we get lots of apoptosis again in fibrin genifin. We add the microbeads, we do quite well. And um, then if we add the microbeads with, now RGD is a cell adhesion molecule, which is found in fibrin. So that's why we use that one. So, um, so we seem to get this back down to, to fibrin. So we think we can now have a strategy where we can protect these cells in, in a more stiff matrix. Um, this, um, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I might zoom through this a little bit, but, um, but we'll, um, but interestingly, we're, we're largely in most of these conditions where uh, we're generally maintaining our annulus phenotype, but, but in fibrin genifin with the microbeads without the RGD peptides, it what's interesting, the cells don't know, well, you know, they, this is an environment where they're alive and ready to produce, but they don't, they're not behaving like an annulus cell. So they're, they're throwing down lots of matrix, lots of collagen one, they're reducing uh, uh, scleraxis, um, they're producing collagen 12 so that they can just lay down a, 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 a pericellular matrix. So that's what we think is largely happening in that condition. Uh, fibrin genifin itself has, has the RGD peptides. So, and then the, looking at the staining, this is just early result. We're seeing a little bit of diffuse staining, which we're, we expect these matrix molecules, GAGs, collagen to be more diffuse. It's, we sort of want to see a little more matrix staining, but, but we're at least seeing things in the right direction. So this is ongoing work that we're uh, pretty excited about. Uh, and we're going to continue our culturing. We're going to go into organ culture. Um, and, um, and, and then, so that, um, so then I, I'm assuming I've got a few more minutes um, and I'd like to, uh, we can either pause for a minute for questions or else uh, the next, I'll pivot a little here for what cells to deliver. So if anyone sort of had questions they wanted to ask about, now's a good time or else we can wait for another, about another five or 10 minutes. Hey Jim, yeah. really, really great presentation so far. Question I had for you is if you look at some of your genomic and I guess, have you done some transcriptomic studies as well? Have you seen any like uh, players that you can target uh, that can help with kind of the pathogenesis the pathway you're showing us here? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And um, it's, uh, 
the, um, so we, um, the, uh, we've got a lot of that data for a couple of different models, right? So this model, we're trying to say, are these annulus cells behaving like annulus cells? And, um, and uh, we're sort of seeing that, right? Um, uh, because based on our controls, um, we're pretty close to one in these markers. Uh, and, uh, and that's sort of the tissue engineering question. And then there's a question that you're sort of raising for like discogenic pain, uh, which uh, we've done a bunch of uh, uh, transcriptomic studies. And, um, and I'll actually share some interesting new results uh, uh, on our regeneration model uh, that'll, come, that'll come shortly. And, um, but yeah, these are, these are really important questions and, and uh, we definitely think about them pretty regularly in some other model systems. Uh, and it, you know, the um, and in particular, sort of thinking about painful discs and non-painful discs. This is uh, this is a great question. Um, we're, we've definitely done some of that. And in, in general, you know, the rule of thumb is it's a highly pro-inflammatory condition uh, that's driving uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. So our discogenic pain work is focused on TNF alpha modulation and understanding differences between receptor one and receptor two. Dr. Richardies, thanks so much for a great talk so far. I just had one question um, regarding the uh, five gen with the microbeads. Um, have you, given that you're looking at that uh, with apoptosis, is there any data, have you guys looked at the compressive forces and biomechanical stress um, when you're incorporating in the microbeads compared to just the five gen data alone that you showed? Yeah, I mean, that's, we have done that. And just because I, I'm showing a lot, I'm not presenting that. We do have a compromise of that as you would expect. And, um, you know, we've I shifted a little bit in our thinking um, about whether or not you can have a very soft compressible material and you might not stabilize quite as well, but it may, if it's soft, it might just deform under loading. So, um, so we think, um, and that may be okay. So, so, so we, we do think we have a bit of a balance in our model system and the properties are showing that, but we do need to get it in situ in this herniation risk model, which we haven't done yet. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, interestingly, some of our work, you know, we've historically said we must match the properties and. And we're actually seeing a, a balance where sometimes we're showing if you have a very soft deformable material, it's maybe good enough. Uh, and it, as long as it doesn't have a herniation risk um, and sometimes soft is okay with uh, uh, reducing herniation risk. So they're a great question, thanks. Why, why do you think that the scaffolding, when you attempted to use the actual scaffolding as opposed to just the five gen, you know, why is the scaffolding itself contributing to a higher herniation risk? I mean, you know, one would think that the increased matrix to lay down on would help with that, that stability. Yeah, I think um, the, the, that scaffold is, is just a, a fairly stiff construct and it's almost like a watermelon seed phenomena. You know, you, you compress it and, it and it pushes out. And, and even if you have the fibrin genobin as a glue, and even if you have that membrane with the suture, you know, it just comes out. So I think, you know, what you described, had the cells been able to grow in and heal, um, it probably wouldn't do that, but, but it takes a long time for that to happen and it herniates before that happens. So, thank you. Um, right, so you can think about this, like what might your rehab procedure be like, is it feasible? And, and I think for that, we felt like it would never be feasible. But, you know, we, we spoke with those uh, that biomaterial expert, and they could definitely redesign their system to be very soft and compressible. So, so the concept itself may not be flawed. It may just be that the specific design choices we made weren't the right, uh, you know, it, it's ver version one was not successful. We might need a V2 or V3 or V4. So, so I, this is, um, so disc injuries, um, uh, annulus injuries in adults just heal fibrotically if they heal at all. This is 
classic paper and canine with a slit defect. This is a mouse mid-sagittal section. Uh, this is a, um, a green is a scleraxis GFP reporter. So, so scleraxis is a well-known tendon marker, but it's also a marker for outer annulus fibrosis. It hasn't been used much in annulus, mostly in tendon research. This happens to be sonic hedgehog uh, glowing red, uh, which is uh, the origin of the nucleus propulsus. Um, but we thought if we had a regenerative healing model, we could use this as a roadmap for how to, um, how to repair discs. And so mice are small and we're using neonatal mice, um, which have been used in other tissues. And these sort of super healer MRL MPJ mice, they don't, they're not very good models for disc healing, but these neonates even smaller. So, so how do we cause a precise um, injury? Well, the scleraxis, which is marking the tendon, also marks the annulus. This allows us to localize these discs. And then under a, micro, under a microscope, we cause an, an injury with a scalpel injury, 80% disc height, uh, critical defect size, and 50% disc uh, uh, diameter. We, um, we cause this um, a nucleus herniation, disc height collapse. Again, it's neonatal. So you can see in this structure, this is the tail because it's easy to access. Um, uh, but you can see the growth plate has tons of cells there, really young animal. Um, what we're seeing, and this is the same imaging with uh, polarized light. Uh, this is, and under cryosection, this is what those annular fibers in the mice look like. So we see this needle track and adjacent fibers are retained. This is day three and day 56. Um, adult, very uh, little matrix deposition, uh, adjacent fibers, very disrupted. Neonates, um, uh, a pretty robust fiber deposition, but we didn't restore the structure and the adjacent fibers still look really good. So uh, this is high quality structural healing, even though it's not regeneration. But so the next question was function. Again, most sensitive parameter is uh, disc height. A disc height is lost uh, compared to the control in the adult and in the uh, neonate is not um, and uh, it is restored. So this is great. Uh, I'm gonna zoom through this, but basically uh, tensile vertebrae, disc vertebrae sections, lots of different parameters. All the adults had inferior healing, all the neonates had restored healing. It was so functional healing. We we're really pleased about that. Um, why is this happening? Well, it's really, this is, this is really the big thing here. There's a ton more cells in the, in the neonate injury site than there are in the adults. And um, this is largely related to proliferation of cells at early time points. And it's not really related to cell death from the injury because tunnel, tunnel was really low, almost undetectable. So, uh, so that's our, our concept. Um, so I think, um, so scleraxis, uh, this, this is basically saying, so blue is DAPI, this is where cells are. Scleraxis is whether or not they're acting like annual, mature annulus fibrosis cells. This is the injury site. This is the control up here. So day three, um, this is what the scleraxis looks like. Day, day three and day 28, um, the injury site has lots of cells, but they're not acting like mature annulus cells. At day 56, they are, uh, there's a lot more green in this staining. And we also did collagen as a marker as well. So uh, the majority, not all, but the majority of cells for sclerosis GFP, and many of them are also expressing um, uh, collagen one. So, so in terms of a marker of, uh, uh, is a cell acting like, like an annulus, a mature annulus cell, we think sclerosis is, is a good marker for that. And that's really just, pretty new information for the field. Um, we were able to track, the, this is another genetic model, so we can track these annulus cells, not just say, are they behaving like an annulus cell, but are these annulus cells involved in repair? So uh, this is pink, and we're showing very relatively few at day three, but we did identify uh, SCA1, which is a progenitor marker in mice. Um, uh, lots of progenitor cells in here, uh, by day 14, we're seeing a mix, uh, lots of progenitors still, 
some of which are uh, from original annulus cells, uh, annulus fibrosis cells. Um, and then by um, day 56, uh, we're seeing again a mix, uh, lots of progenitors, uh, many of which are from these original annulus fibrosis cells. And then a bunch of these annulus fibrosis cells have now also turned on the green staining to say that they're now acting like a, a mature annulus fibrosis cell. So they're recruited, they, they proliferate, and then they redifferentiate into a mature annulus fibrosis cell. So even though we didn't restore the structure perfectly, we see regeneration. So we looked at lots of cells and because Costas asked the question, I wanna just talk about something we're currently looking at. So we looked at lots of markers, right? And, and we, we saw macrophages were important, but it's like, you we're just sort of throwing darts here. So, so Costas really put his finger on it. It's like, you, you need some unbiased, robust approaches. So, so as a proof of concept, we, we need to do this in mice, but as a proof of concept, uh, we're working, um, uh, at RNA sequencing here at, at Sinai. And we, because we have a lot of experience with cow, where we did a quarter, we cut, cut this disc into a quarter and brought it to single cell sequencing. Um, and this is what I'll end on. I've got maybe two, two or three more slides. Um, the, so, so this is basically, this is now you've got, so the RNA, single cell RNA sequencing, each, each of these dots is a cell. Uh, each of these is a different disk from different donors and different um, and, and different levels. And this uh, UMAP is a way of visualizing this. So you've got all these different genes, all these different cells, and, and it's basically a clustering analysis uh, uh, the inform informatics folks do. So, so uh, what is, you know, I don't necessarily expect you to, to see this too quickly, but the shape of all these should look pretty similar. So we're basically showing uh, the cell populations were quite similar across three donors and two levels. We're pleased about that. We had very clear distinction of collagen two expressing maybe nucleus propulsive cell versus a collagen one expressing annulus cell. And we saw at least 14 populations. So when we look at this, so this, these colors and these numbers are unbiased. Um, and we're seeing at least 14 different populations of cells in this intervertebral disc. Um, and then when we look at the canonical markers, the known markers, we can identify what are likely outer annulus fibrosis populations, nucleus propulsus population. And we're seeing at least sort of three populations of outer annulus. We're seeing some transition zone cells. We're seeing notochordal cells. And then some other cells that were pretty interesting uh, expressing markers we wouldn't necessarily expect. Uh, endothelial cells, neuronal cells, although this is a pretty small population, smooth, smooth muscle cell markers. Um, so this is really, I think, a key area, both for understanding what these cells are uh, that are even in there, as well as these healing processes. So that's what we're looking at. Again, we're, we can also use it to identify novel markers we hadn't thought of because it's an unbiased approach. So, so I'll end uh, there uh, highlighting back pain, critical global challenge. This defects play a major role. Annulus is a substantial, but I think achievable. Uh, annulus repair is substantial, but achievable research and clinical goal. We can do lots of biomaterial analyses to balance stability and, and delivery. And that we think uh, these neonatal models and single cell analyses will be able to really uh, advanced annulus repair methods. Uh, so uh, this again, I acknowledge the group, the underlying folks are, are the ones involved in this work. And we've had, uh, uh, are fortunate to have good NIH funding, mostly from NIAMS in, in the past. So thanks again uh, so much for the discussions and uh, would love to ask more questions or, or, or have more discussion if, if questions are there. Hi, Jim, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, hi, this is Tim Chowdhury. First of all, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation of your work. And uh, that really was a highlight of a couple hours that displayed the robust spine community we have at Mount Sinai and that we're all very lucky to be a part of. My question has to do with the clinical real world applications of this and the timeline when you think it may get there. 
In particular, if you, uh, those who follow golf know that Tiger Woods this weekend on Sunday um, on the broadcast mentioned that he was waiting for an MRI to see whether his annulus is sealed and whether he was going to be able to return in time for the Masters. Unfortunately, now with another tragic accident, he's not going to make it back. But I guess the question to you is, uh, you know, what do we know about the timeline of annulus fibrosis um, repair after surgery? And I, I wasn't really aware that MRIs could be used in that way to check on the ceiling. What can you comment on the radiographic assessment of that as well as the timeline in humans? Uh, uh, wonderful question. Thank you. Well, I, I think there are some exciting options that are sort of emerging on a pretty short timeline, right? So, um, so the barricade system, for example, is uh, I think, uh, you know, I know it had FDA review. I don't know if it was um, limited approval or full approval. So at least that annulus repair device is available for use for certain indications. Um, and then I think the, the results in the mesoblast cell delivery trial, uh, which has a hyaluronic acid carrier. And in fact, the carrier might've been as beneficial as the uh, cells that they just, they're undergoing FDA review now and the results, at least from the press release, look really good. So, um, so I have a feeling, and they've, Mesoblast has been working pretty closely with Sinai for different, um, different projects. Uh, so I, I think they would be interested in, in advancing some, some efforts. Uh, so I think that's gonna be out at some point in a relatively short time frame. Um, uh, some of the materials we're talking about have a longer time frame. You know, the, the just a, annular sealant alone, uh, where we really need to do the, uh, have an NDA type approach, which we're still uh, years away from. Uh, and we, but if it, things still look good, that's uh, years before we could do our, our uh, first in human. But, um, but that, um, but we'd like to try to get there and accelerate as quickly as possible. And um, and there are other strategies, uh, other injections that aren't used for pain pain modulation. I think that probably we could get there a little bit faster. Um, but this annual sealant is probably still we're talking uh, many years uh, away. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Iatridis? Re really awesome talk, Jim, and we appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. Our program director and associate program director, we're gonna try to set up a meeting with you so we can see how our residents can really work with you. Um, you know, spine is such an important part of our training and, and to do some research in that area, I think is just crucial. So. Yeah. You know, I think if you have any thoughts on that, we could talk offline, but, uh, you know, we really enjoy having you this morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Costas. Um, yeah, and well, it, it is a real pleasure to get to know folks a little bit more. Um, again, the, so there's a whole nother half of the program on the discogenic pain uh, project that in some ways might be a little bit uh, better uh, or, or would also be, I could say, a good fit with, with uh, neurosurgery here. And and I, I really think some of this tissue banking and having, you know, brainstorming a vision of what we might do with those tissues and the key questions on trans transcriptomics or other things that we could ask with a robust uh, bank of, of tissues and cells. I think, I think that's, a, that's a key question that would be really exciting. We'd love to continue these discussions. Awesome. All right, well, thank you, everybody. All right, thanks, everyone.